Okay, we're going to go on with the second talk of the day. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Miranj, of which Pratik is the other half. We had Sovik yesterday, who was the, he was Hardy, so we've got Laurel. And as appropriate, it starts off with an XKCD slide. Um, Pratik and I have worked together, um, and I've enjoyed working with him. He, uh, Miranj is a small web design company which actually thinks about its work. Uh, it doesn't just do stuff, thinks about why it's doing it. And I think that's part of what you're going to be explaining to us today. OK, are we good to go? Yeah. Sounds good. What is the most resilient parasite? Bacteria, a virus, an intestinal worm. Uh, what Mr. Cobb is trying to say. An idea. Resilient, highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. An idea that is fully formed, fully understood, that sticks right in there somewhere. Hello, everyone. Um... Today I'm going to be talking about design by philosophy. Uh, thanks, Rahul, for the introduction. And uh, I enjoyed working with you a lot as well. And uh, like he mentioned, I'm the other half of Miranj. Uh, you have met Sovik yesterday. Uh, and thanks, Tulsi, as well, for that talk. Uh, I think um, it's good that I'm following her. She, she spoke about design thinking and the process. And I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on that thinking part. And design is pretty rock solid. Our law should be designed to protect free speech. MLR is a very well-designed convention center. Um, some other fields of design that you might have come across, heard. So what really is design? Um, that, or is it like um, OK to be used in one, one phase, like when designing websites, and not OK to be used, say, when talking about laws or something like that? Or does it, is there some um, answer to this, what is design, which can cover all of it? Now. Um, I believe there are two broad components to this. One is the, the part about where you think of the solution. One is where you actually go on to implementing the solution. There's some debate amongst designers as to where implementing is really our work, uh, if it's the engineer's work or you know, whoever's getting down to enforcing whatever the designers suggest. But we'll keep that for another day. Uh, today, we want to focus on the first part, which is actually thinking about and reasoning, about, reasoning out our solutions. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll use the help of uh, Jason Santa Maria to um, say why we should be focusing on that right now. Uh, there was this book called Insights, um, a book of interviews. Um, quite quite a good good book. You should check it out if you haven't. And in that, uh, there was this a part where Jason said, you're going to have your entire life to learn about tools, but if you're not a good thinker from the get-go, and if you, get, if you don't develop your mind, you're lost. I think that's the most powerful tool you can have. It sounds right, but it's true, because that's what sets you apart. You can always get better at Photoshop, but you have to sharpen your mind first. So if we try to answer that question of what is design from the coming up with answers part, um, the, after thinking about this for quite a while and going through lots of different answers, the one that I have settled on, or at least that seems to answer this question best for me right now, is um, design is decisions towards a certain goal. Um, I'll use the help of another um, superstar designer, so to say, to um, explain this further. Frank Chimero. Uh, you might have noticed he's a recurring feature in uh, Meta Refresh. Navjot brought him up yesterday as well. So um, he gave this talk called The Shape of Design, and he'd also written a book by it, by the way, um, at Build Conference in, uh, in the UK, I think, back in November 2010. There he went all the way back to Greek philosophers, Socrates, and um, he said Socrates had this logic machine which said if A equals B, B equals C, then C equals A. Transitivity, we might have learned it in school. Normal logic, if um, magnetic things are attracted to magnets and if paper clips are magnetic, then paper clips are attracted to magnet. That sort of thing. This is a very good feature to have. What this means is it deals in absolutes. Um, you know if you do a certain step, then there's going to be a fixed absolute outcome for that. One plus one will be two. And conversely, if you know what output you want, you can sort of work out where you should start or what input you should give. But 
And he had this fantastic slide to follow up. Design doesn't generally seem to work that way because this is where it lives. This is a slide from his talk. There's logic and design is completely outside of it. And um, the reason Frank said this is, uh, and which I completely believe is true, is because design deals with people. And people are motivated by emotions. Uh, we don't care if one plus one is two all the time. Like if I'm not feeling well today or I'm not happy, I'm pissed off, then, then I don't know, I might just not like a green button. Uh, some other day, someone else might like a green button, uh, so on and so forth. People are very hard to um, put into a different definite pattern. They're, they're emotional. So then he takes the help of another philosopher, Greek philosopher, uh, who came after Socrates, um, Aristotle. He looks at Socrates' logic machine and he says that this holds true only in the domain of truth, the area where um, things can cannot be other than they are. Uh, and then he goes on to define another logic machine um, or improve that. And he says there's this other area where things can be other than what they are. And um, Frank says when he, when he read his description, um, he was like, this is it. This is what design is. And uh, Aristotle said that using good deliberation, understanding, resulting in deliberate desire to be carried out with cleverness. Now, it's a bit loaded. But if you go, go through it um, once again, good deliberation, understanding, so decisions and with a deliberate desire, so that's our goal. We, we make decisions uh, to the best of our capability towards a certain goal. And there's also this other part where we actually go on to implement those decisions, which is the technical know-how, skill, craft, and art involved in production, manufacturing, and making. Uh, but today, we'll focus on the first part, so decisions towards a certain goal. Now, if you're all comfortable with that um, definition of design or um, description, um, definition is probably a stronger word. So um, there are a few traits that we could uh, we can see. One that design is uncertain. You know, we don't know uh, if going a certain route will give us the results we want. Maybe it's the other route. Um, it's uncertain by definition, and it's unpredictable uh, in the sense that because something might have worked earlier once, uh, there is no guarantee that it will work again. There are lots and lots of factors involved here. Number one of them being people. So. Design is uncertain, unpredictable. These are obviously not very good traits for uh, when you're trying to achieve a certain goal. Um, you want some surety. You want to know that you're going in the right direction. So then how do we really go about making decisions? Uh, mostly, when we, whenever we are, um, say you're deciding to implement a feature, uh, you, you've thought about it. Maybe you know, what, what your goal is. You, you, wanna, you want to sell a t-shirt, so uh, you're building, building a site, and you've got to decide, OK, I can maybe put three t-shirts on the page, one t-shirt on the page, or maybe have my entire catalog there. So you might have like three options here, and you're wondering where you should go. But because uh, there is no sure answer, how do you really decide? I mean, is a designer just a random function? Do we make decisions just out of the blue? Uh, of course, I hope you all agree that that's not the case. We, we reason out um, generally based on uh, the, the end goal. And, and thinking is what, what, what best will get us there. But, but because we're unsure, we use different methods to try and um, justify decisions. A popular one, for example, is A-B testing. So if you we, if we go back to this um, analogy of maybe having three tunnels. So A-B testing is the way of you go down uh, the first tunnel a short way, you see, see if that is getting you better towards the goal. You come back, go down towards the second tunnel, go, come back, go back towards the third tunnel, so on and so forth. That, that might work sometimes, but you know, if you're going to encounter 100 tunnels in your, along your way, how many times are you going to do that? Uh, plus, with every project that you start, do you want to be doing the same thing over and over again? Is there nothing that we learn that we can bring forward as, as our career progresses, as we gain more experience? Um, I think there's, there is something there, and um, that's a more foundational thing, the sort of stuff we believe in, principles that the, the, uh, if you might have taken a particular route in um, five projects, and we've seen that that's, that seems to be working for us, and we, then we maybe start having more conviction, that gut feel that, OK, this might be the right way to go. So these foundations can be extremely, extremely helpful in um, basing your decisions on something, because that now you're not leaving it to chance. You're saying, uh, I have this history behind me uh, where I've, I've reasoned out, or I've uh, I believe in this principle, and I've seen this carry out, uh, give me my results. So 
I'm going to carry forward again uh, with my decisions based on principles. I think it'll be better ex explained if I give you some examples. For example, um, you might believe that in a, in a philosophy or a principle that says interactions should be simplified, um, that gives you good results. So how can we go about simplifying interactions? Say we, we're looking addressing the problem of payments over the counter. The most obvious way to carry out this interaction would be to actually hand over cash. And the cashier gives you back change. A uh, simpler version of this interaction may be to hand over a card instead, and the cashier swipes the card. Can this be made simpler? Maybe you just go to the cashier and say, uh, the actual task we're performing is authorizing the cashier to, make, to, to take the money from us. So maybe all we need to do is give that authorization. Like, OK, I'm, I'm ready to pay. So let's see how this problem has been solved and how the interaction has already been made simpler. So you can actually uh, turn this feature on we call um, auto tab which allows you to automatically open a tab with that merchant. So you can set this in, and when you're within 50 meters of that merchant, when you're walking up to the counter, your name and your picture appear on the register, as does your last order. So I had a cappuccino yesterday. So without bringing out my phone, without bringing out my wallet, I can say, I want a cappuccino, put it on Jack, they find me, they verify my picture is, is me, they hit the button, and done. My, my, my card is charged in the background, I get my cappuccino, I've never had to touch anything, I didn't have to wave any device, um, I didn't have to swipe a card, I didn't have to fuddle around with cash, and I get a little push notification afterwards asking me if I want a tip all on my own speed, all asymmetrically. It's impressive. How does it compare to what uh, Google and, and Apple and others are excited about? What's NFC, near field communication, where you hold your cell phone up to pay? How would you compare it? Well, I think the, the biggest thing for me is like, um, NFC is another thing that you have to do. It's another action that you have to take. And it's not the most human action to wave a device around another device and wait for a beep, right? So it just doesn't feel right. I would rather just use my name to pay. I'm Jack. This is me. There's another, another thing you might have noticed there about this last bit about the NFC, that there, at least there seems to be a philosophy working here that humans like doing human interactions. The more inhuman the interaction, like you know, taking out a, another piece of equipment and waving that, the less smooth it is, the less likely that people want to go through that. So. Um, what more can we do with interactions? Maybe you have a belief that says that you should reduce your interactions and that gives you better products. All right. Um, we, the square one is also another example of, in a way, reducing, uh, reducing your um, interaction. But maybe a better example is, say you're designing an e-book reader and um, a person comes in and is reading the book and then he leaves somewhere in the middle of his book and then he returns back. Uh, when he comes back, he's got to go back and find the page he was on and start reading from there again. Um, what could you do to reduce his interaction? You could always remember where he left, where was the last page he was reading. And when he comes back and he opens the book again, you just bring him there. Another trait that you might think is favorable is prevent repetition. If people are performing the same tasks over and over again, uh, help them by making this easier. Uh, one great example that uh, we can see on ClearTrip's side is it saves your recent searches. And it just gives you that you can pick off from where you left off. Another clear trip example is um, Expressway. You save your payment, uh, your credit card details there. You don't have to enter them again every time you go and you have to make a payment. So with interaction, simplify, reduce, prevent, rep prevent repetition. Um, another belief that you might have is robustness. It's good to have your um, products be robust. So there's this um, Postel's law that you might have heard. Uh, be conservative in what you send, liberal in what you accept. How do you apply this in, say, input fields? Uh, you have a credit card field. Now, Sovic touched on this again yesterday. Um, but from a point of view of not exposing implementation details, uh, I think uh, there's another way of looking at this, which is to just try to make it more robust and human friendly, uh, irrespective of what your implementation is anyway. Do you accept all different forms? Do you uh, count for human errors? When you're accepting numbers, uh, does your field break if there's a comma in between digits? Uh, if you're accepting dates, uh, do you take care of yesterday, next Thursday, so on and so forth? Um, another group of principles um, that you might think um, that you like is um, 
the web platform is full of known unknowns and that we should cater for known unknowns. What are known unknowns? Let's take an example. The user agent. Now this, this is a very common one and uh, there, I mean everyone advocates that you should make your uh, sites be standards compliant and uh, thus work on as many browsers as possible. Of course we know that just making standards compliant is not guaranteed to work but uh, that's the general goal anyway. Another one that's been popular these days is the viewport. So um, we've realized that um, we do not know what the dimensions of the screen that our user will be using will be. So we've got this thing called responsive design where we try to cater for all this, all the known unknown, the viewport is unknown. So no matter what dimensions you're coming to us from, we will help you use the site in that. Um, another one, bandwidth. This is where aware aware of this but uh, oftentimes we forget about bandwidth being a known uh, being an unknown so yesterday there were um, demos going on and the internet was slow and uh, that sites that were not loading fast because the internet was slow were um, obviously not catering for that I mean the with the proliferation of mobile devices we should of course be aware uh, cater, uh, catering for um, scenarios where bandwidth will be extremely low and your site should not stop working because you have bad network connection Browser compatibility. Um, what I mean here is um, different versions of different browsers have different features in them. Um, different versions of uh, the same browser as well have different features in them. So should you only expose certain features to the newer browsers and cut away everyone who's uh, coming with an older browser? Uh, most likely not. You should use something called progressive enhancement. Processing power. Um, people ex accessing your site from a uh, phone device versus a desktop device will have widely varying uh, RAM and CPU power. So you should be empathetic towards that. You should not just assume that you have all this um, um, RAM available to you that you're going to use by throwing in a lot of images and uh, make the web, the web page rendering uh, a really process intensive task because you don't know if uh, every person visiting your site has the same capability. Context. This is um, uh, when I think uh, it's it's less these days, but initially, t uh, about three four years back, when people started doing the whole mobile thing, uh, they were like, people visiting our site from the mobile need the phone number, they need the menu fast. But people visiting our site from the desktop, oh, they can download a two two MB uh, you know fancy image of our restaurant because they don't need the phone number and the menu fast. Well, that's obviously the wrong way to go about it. Uh, you cannot assume that just because someone is accessing your site from the mobile that he already has a set context. Sure, there might be people who need your um, menu. Sure, there might be people who just need to, for example, uh, check the reservation, but uh, this thought that people, on, people don't do real tasks on the mobile is getting less and less valid. A lot of people are only accessing the web from, from mobile devices these days. So not having feature parity between, say, your mobile site and your desktop site is a very bad thing, in my opinion. Locale. Um, can you assume all the users visiting your visiting your site are from the same country or from the same region? They understand the same references, um, the same notations. Um, for example, using commas as decimal places or uh, periods as decimal places, decimal um, separator. Language, another thing that is often ignored. Um, when your site is on the web, it's available for anyone across the world to, to access it. Are you catering for people who might not understand English or um, any other language that you're developing in? And finally, but of course not um, unimportant, human abilities, accessibility. Are you empathetic, em empathetic towards people who um, might have uh, visual impairments, um, auditory impairments? Are you catering for that audience as well? So, for example, some of the known unknowns that you might want to cater for. And copy. Um, you might believe that copy is very important in your um, interface. Copy makes or breaks an interface. So. Uh, there's this quote by the Apple Human Interface Group that they come up in 1980s, I think, when they were designing the Macintosh, that a word is worth a thousand pictures. Uh, Navjot brought this up um, in his talk yesterday where, uh, about icons and labels, you know. How clear are icons without labels? So this is what Gmail has. They, they used to have labels on their icons earlier, uh, I mean labels on their buttons, but in their redesign they got rid of them. And if you notice the, the second button on there with the download arrow, uh, with the arrow, sorry. Uh, so. Most, most cases where you see a button, an icon of that kind, it, it is used to denote download. But here, it is supposed to mean archive. Um, are they improving the usability by getting rid of that labels, or are they just 
doing the aesthetic thing, you know, it maybe looks more minimal, but is it better? Maybe not. Uh, catering for the extremes. This is another um, very common um, design philosophy that if you build for um, the two extremes of user, maybe the most expert user and the most uh, novice user, then you automatically cater for everyone in between. That's the philosophy you can follow. Some other ones, um, you shouldn't have to explain your interface. You should hire implementation like Sawik brought up yesterday. Simple terms complex, direction over choice. Um, there's this other list of user interface principles by Joshua Porter. Uh, I've selected a few of them. Clarity is a job number one. Conserve attention at all costs. One primary action per screen. Um, provide a natural next step, so on and so forth. And of course, um, there are um, the legendary designers and their sets of principles like with Dieter Rams and his 10 principles of good design. Uh, I'll just let him explain them. Meine Erfahrung ist, dass die Gebraucher sehr positiv reagieren, wenn Dinge einsichtig sind, begreifbar sind. Das ist, was mich heute besonders stört, ist diese äh, diese Beliebigkeit und die äh, auch damit verbundene Gedankenlosigkeit, mit der vieles produziert und vermarktet wird. Nicht nur auf äh, dem Gebrauchsgütersektor, sondern in der Architektur, in der Werbung. Überall haben wir zu viel Überflüssiges. Gutes Design sollte innovativ sein. Gutes Design macht ein Produkt brauchbar. Gutes Design ist ästhetisches Design. Gutes Design macht ein Produkt verständlich. Gutes Design ist ehrlich. Gutes Design ist unaufdringlich. Gutes Design ist langlebig. Gutes Design ist konsequent bis ins letzte Detail. Gutes Design ist umweltfreundlich. Last but not least. Gutes Design ist so wenig Design wie möglich. Now, um, we've seen a few uh, principles or philosophies or ideas, whatever you want to call them, that, that um, people use and that you might use. Where this gets really interesting is um, when you're making a decision and two or three of these are conflicting. Like, for example, um, say you're designing um, search functionality. And you want to give the ability for people to filter down on their results. Now, um, the more filters you give, the better the user will be able to target their result. But the more filters you give, the more complex your interface for the filters becomes. So the less likely it is that, that the user is actually going to go ahead and use those filters. So here we, we have two or three principles uh, conflicting and coming against each other. Um, in the Gmail example that I gave, you want your interface to be um, calm and not overwhelming. So you want to keep the amount of visual elements there down. But at the same time, you want it to be usable. So there's, do you remove the labels or do you let the labels be there? So um, this is where it's extremely important that when you have these principles of philosophies, that you have them in a sort of priority. Is it more important for your, for your products to be aesthetic or is it more important for them to be accessible? Um, is it more important for them to be usable, for instance? So Doug Bowman, the guy who's leading um, design at Twitter these days, he, he said this in a, a recent tweet that all design is a series of compromises, but good design finds the right ones. And what is good design to you will, I mean, that's, that's your choice. You, it's, it's up for you to come up with your own priority of, of your um, principles, but you should definitely have them. And that's when, when you have to make a choice between which one you compromise on, then you know where to go. So. Um, like I showed that, I showed a few uh, few examples, and um, what I'm advocating here is you don't have to follow these these principles per se. Come up with your own principles with your experience. Think about all the decisions that you take. Why do you take those decisions? Why do you have this strong belief in them? And use that as a basis for, for designing your apps. Uh, question the why, like Navjot said yesterday, and, and get to the root cause. So 
he brought up this, ex this great example of um, reading an article about typography by Jason Santa Maria, uh, where he spoke of, say, the line height, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, going a few days later, or maybe uh, sometime down the line, um, when he realizes that it was not really about the line height, but it's about making the thing readable. So when you are setting, say, the line height, then question why are you doing that? Get, get to the root of it, because you're trying to make something readable. So maybe that's what you want to believe in, that, that your sites, your products your, uh, should be readable, the text on there. Um, Another, another clip to reinforce this, this subtlety of getting to the basic. No, it's not just about depth. You, know, you need the simplest version of the idea in order for it to grow naturally in your subject's mind. It's a very subtle art. And finally, um, evolve. So ideas that don't work out, put them away, just like natural evo evolution works. If you, if you come across something, if you come across an app, a product that you, that you feel is very well designed, that you like, F try to think about, use the five why questioning, you know, ask questions, why do you think this is working? Create the space for the answer and add those things to your set of philosophies, your beliefs. And whatever doesn't work out, leave them. Go forward, design your products using your beliefs. Thank you. Yeah. All right, questions, anyone? What design philosophies have you implemented in your life, like, ferociously? Um, well, not surprisingly, most of the ones that I put up yeah. on screen, yeah. Okay. So just all of them? But it's not exhaustive. Uh, it's hard to... It, the, um, these things live more in the subconscious than in the conscious, uh, because, yeah, it, it's the gut feel. It's... If, if I'm trying to have to consciously think of it, then I don't think I believe in it strongly enough. So it goes in the back of the mind, and then uh, it's, it's hard to come up with the exhaustive list of them all. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so first, perhaps less seriously, maybe it's a question to everybody, but do you have to speak German to actually become a design thought leader? <laughs> because whatever you say just sounds great. I mean, like, I didn't need subtitles. I was like, yeah, I'm listening to this guy. <laughs> so, and um, the other question, I mean, since you brought up Doug Bowman at Twitter, um, and again, not necessarily to you, Pratik, but they seem to be making a lot of compromises. I wonder whether those are the best ones. Yeah. So it's interesting how, for me, philosophy is interesting because in its interaction with the real world. Uh, what do you do when your philosophy doesn't allow you to do what you need to? What kinds of compromises or how pragmatic, how does pragmatism and philosophy work together? Do they work together? Okay, so um, the, uh, the real world or this context, uh, so, so to say, will probably limit the extent in which you can go towards implementing your philosophy. For example, if we take that, um, you should be focusing on the goal and, and um, trying to simplify the interaction. The whole the payment example again, right? Maybe when we started out payments on the web, uh, people might have just adopted the physical offline model of send someone a check uh, because there might not have been the technology of payment gateways. But then someone must have realized, must have thought that you know this is not the best we can do. We've got to simplify this further. So they so this whole uh, ecosystem of um, credit cards and payment gateways on the on the net must have come up. Then Amazon must have gone forward, or I mean, at least they have the patent, but uh, I, I don't believe that that's, that they invented that because they have the patent, but they must have gone forward and thought that, uh, sure, people have to, people can now make payments online directly, but they shouldn't have to enter their details again and again, so we have this thing called one-click payment where we will save the thing and um, go ahead and let them just click and buy. So technology or the real world or the conditions in the real world might be limiting um, the extent to which we can carry out what we really want to today. But it sets our goal that this is the direction we're headed in. And if we're not there yet, we've got to work more to get there. And if we see that this is not working, like I said, then we've got to, of course, like always retrospect. Um, 
is this giving me the results I was, that I was after? Am I getting to my goal? If I'm not, then maybe this is not the right thing I should be believing in and move away something like this. Hello. Hey. Hi. Um, how do you uh, think about designing for uh, power users? Uh, where in the initial learning curve or the discoverability of uh, the product is not that important consider uh, compared to you know the functionality of or the usage pattern or the you know uh, for example compare uh, uh, textmate to vim yep. you know vim is like super hard to learn for uh, initially it seems like super hard to learn uh, things are not as easy to discover but then once you get it, you can really work with it really well. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on designing interfaces or, or designing functionalities which are important for power users? Okay, so um, I'll answer that in two points. First is, uh, is it important for products to be learnable? And uh, how do we go about designing products for power users, right? So, um, uh, I was having a chat just yesterday uh, at the after party um, where if a product if is not usable, then uh, there's a very low chance that a user is actually going, going on to is actually going to go on to become a power user because uh, no matter how uh, how well your your product is tuned for expert users, uh, someone who comes comes across is for the first time is always going to be a new user. So if he's not able to get from that stage to new from a new user to power user, then we have lost the advantage of making it um, well designed for power user because he's not able to become a power user. Now, uh, as far as designing for power users are concer is concerned, um, it, it is the same as uh, designing for any user, so to say. And uh, like Tulsi had mentioned, you know, profile your users, find out what, what, what are the tasks they do, what, do they, what are the goals they're after. For um, some, some things that I can think of right now is power users mostly uh, do a lot of things again and again. Like you might, um, if, if say someone is cut, uh, cutting and copying text all the time. So uh, for a new user, it might be friendly to have a button that says copy. But you know that if a power user is doing that this five times uh, in like a minute, you want to give him a keyboard shortcut to do that. You don't want to make him go use his mouse and press a button to do that. So find out what are the things, what are the tasks your power users are performing. Make it as easy and simple as it is as you can for them to get to do those tasks. Sure, sure. Um, hi. So uh, just interesting because you know Opera, the browser, uh, has been around for 15 years now. And when we were working there, internally, we knew that it worked great for power users. But we knew that's the only set of users it was really useful for. Yeah, so a everyone who used Opera, we were like, oh, these are the people who are real geeks and they know all the shortcuts. That's who we were building it for. And you know, over time, that was the realization. We were like, hold on, yeah, we're building it for power users. We're putting all these shortcuts and you know, you can do all these you can press a dot and search in the page and all these short, but we're like, for a normal new user, it was very difficult. The reason the new users were using Opera was because of completely different reasons, not because it, was, it had all these shortcuts, because it could work well on a very low config machine and on a slow connection, it was really, really fast. Right, so it was very different, but, but there was a gap. So over, actually, if you look at Opera in the last five, six years, that they've tried to bridge that gap, but they, it was, I thought it was interesting because it, came from a completely different point, right? It wasn't that it was built for the normal users and then power users, it was built for power users. And then it came this way. And you can look at, you know, how the opera, po how popular or what kind of people it was popular with, you know. Hey Pratik, uh, really great talk. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, one of the things I think uh, Pratik mentioned is progressive disclosure. Uh, some of the apps that I've worked on where you have novice users and sort of advanced users, you hide some of the advanced functionality so that people kind of stumble upon it accidentally. And there's this, it creates a sense of enlightenment, right? When you find these things by accident and you realize at that point that you've become a power user. Um, so the question I had for you was about the evolve. Mm -hmm. um, I think as designers, you know, we do things and then like two months later we're like, oh shit, that I thought it was a good idea at the time, but actually it isn't. Mm -hmm. And I want to change this paradigm. And that sometimes becomes difficult for our users, right? Like when we keep changing our minds and we think, okay, you know, I'm going to do it this way now. 
um, because they just got used to maybe a bad pattern, but then all of a sudden you change it because you think the pattern is better. Uh, so how do we as designers do a better job of selecting better patterns to start with or communicate that we're changing a pattern for a certain reason? All right. So again, there are two parts. One is how do we select better patterns as designers? And second is how do we um, make the change simpler for our users? Right, Tulsi? Yeah. OK. So uh, I'll answer the how do we make change simpler part first. Um, it was, I think Sovic had answered addresses briefly, but uh, I'm not too sure. Um, sometimes change is disruptive, and it can completely throw your users off. But uh, you, the alternative you have is, uh, are you going to leave them in, in a bad state forever when you know that there's this better, uh, simpler way of doing things? Uh, if, if you can have a transition which guides them from um, the existing place to this, this thing that you know is better, then great. But if you don't, then sometimes you just have to let go of that baggage. Uh, because in the long run, right, if they, they've spent, say, 10 years with, um, with a bad paradigm and they uh, the, the next 10 years could at least be better if they have that one year uh, of transition, which might be a little difficult, but at least uh, the next 10 years will be much more better because of that, versus if we still hang on to the legacy. Uh, now, as far as um, selecting better patterns are concerned, um, I think it's wishful thinking to uh, hope. I mean, we would all want to be as good as we can um, as designers when we are at the end of the career, right from the beginning of a career, right? But that is generally not how things work. We grow older, we learn things, we pick up on our experiences, and uh, and then we, we grow from that. So I don't really have an answer there. All I can say is that um, this is OK. This is the natural way of how things go, uh, where, where we just get better over time if you're paying attention to the right things. And importantly, if you're always looking back at the results of what you've done and uh, checking to see if that worked, did that, um, did that do what you thought it would do? So I didn't answer that question, but yeah, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> um, hi, here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, you, you talked about this designing for the extremities. Uh, you get it right yes. for the, you know, the not power yeah. users and the power users. Yes. You get everyone in between. Uh, one of the interesting things that I've observed is when it comes to API design for documentation. Uh, okay. In, in, I mean, if you're building an SDK, you have a, let's say, any API that you're building, uh, you have users who are just beginning programming. Uh, who are doing basic curl commands and stuff. And you have pro Java developers, pro Ruby developers doing all kinds of stuff. Now, how do you get a site or an API documentation which is easy for beginners to pick up? And have you seen examples which, which kind of bridge this gap really okay. well? Um, so how do we um, design APIs, uh, or how do we present our designed APIs to users which caters the hobby starting a beginner programmer and the expert? programmers, yeah. right? So um, see, the examples uh, I've seen um, are playgrounds that uh, a lot of sites like I think Twitter and um, folks present, uh, where you can try out their calls to the calls to the API right there on, on the browser. You can just choose which call you want to make. You don't actually have to write the code to make the call. You can see the response that you get. So that gives them an idea. And uh, then, you, then, then, then there's, of course, the documentation and you know, all the calls that they, they can actually go and make in their code. Maybe that's not the best solution for it. Um, so the other thing I'll present is, um, have, are you familiar with Bert Victor? Have you seen any of his work? Um, no, not really. OK, so he's a big advocate of um, improving the methods we use to teach programming, uh, or uh, yeah, programming mostly in computer science to people. He's written a, uh, he'd given a presentation, um, I don't remember at which conference, but uh, where he'd shown uh, how our programming environments can be better if they are, if they're more, um, if they're more live, if they're showing us, showing us exactly what is happening in the moment. So if we change a piece of code, what what happens there? And now Khan Academy, uh, the guys uh, behind Khan Academy, when they were building their computer science uh, uh, program, they were really in, uh, inspired by this talk that he'd given, and they had gone ahead and implemented um, uh, a learning environment where using processing uh, where people could come and uh, there would often be a snippet of code, maybe a for loop which draws, um, draws an ellipse and puts uh, some eyes on it and uh, shows, shows a, a, a nice friendly graphic that, that students could come and pick up and look at the code and 
and uh, see, okay, this code does this, and if I change something here, it's going to change there, and th thus get interested and maybe hopefully learn programming. But then he went ahead and, and uh, he he um, he wrote um, a quite an in detailed response to that and and why they had picked up on the wrong aspects of it. He's like, the uh, people learn programming by understanding, not necessarily by seeing how cool it is. So uh, similarly, maybe there are better ways to design this to to guide. Um, new new programmers to your API or to any um, technical thing that you're exposing by making them understand rather than just demoing the cool outcomes of it. So uh, a lot of these um, um, play, playgrounds or whatever API playgrounds that Twitter has or things like that might fall into this trap of just showing this is the end, go end goal you could achieve rather than um, showing uh, the power of it, like as in, no, sorry, but that's the same thing. But um, yeah, go to Bert Victor and read the thing he, he's written. He's, he, he explains this much better than I can, but that's the answer. Hey, here. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a one question here. Uh, recently, we have been uh, developing one application for our company where, uh, you know, we had an Oracle Forms, which is a legacy system, and uh, people were power users on that. Like, they used to remember certain things, query it, and insert the value for that. So we developed an application, parallel application to replace that, and that was on completely new technology, like Web 2.0 standard, Jazzy UI. Uh, when I say Jazzy UI here, user friendly. But then uh, we hit up a, a problem here of pro power users uh, using our new application there. And they were not comfortable with the way we have uh, presented the functionality. So how do we... Uh, narrow down the gap between uh, when we design the application for the power users, but yet we, yet we want to keep the application very simple so that uh, a new use ca newcomer can also be uh, start using that. Okay. So, um, so the question I have for you is before you design that new um, Jazzy UI version of your uh, legacy application, did you go and talk to your power users as to uh, what are the tasks they do and how they would love, uh, I mean, what do they think would be an improvement in their workflow? Um, what would they prefer having to do less of? Um, and and did you go ahead and, and use that in your uh, uh, building process? Yeah. Uh, the answer to that question was, uh, I want as, as simple as uh, existing application. Whatever I, uh, uh, Oracle Forms have, I want that. No, that but was you, the but you, answer. They already had that, right? Yeah. So, did you ask them uh, uh, about any problems that they faced with it? Are there any improvements that that they they, they could see here? The only improvement was in the uh, the way it was. Uh, it was for the configuration of the application. So, the way it was used was the problem. Like you have to go uh, different forms to insert the data. You have to exit and go into the different uh, section and uh, enter the data. So that was the only problem they were facing. That was the answer. Okay. And you fixed these problems and they were not happy with it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't really have much to say then. You have more questions. Why don't you take it to a larger discussion offline? Uh, I, I, I've been waiting. <laughs> okay. We can have one last question. Yeah. yeah hello. Um, just from, an, uh, I guess, an end user point of view is that we all seem like we all like human interaction, but no one wants to interact as though they're human, which is absolutely bloody ridiculous. So, and I'm trying to explain to designers as well as developers that you guys are actually the minority, not the majority. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to appeal to the majority in order to be able to bring us in so that there's no longer that gap between minority and majority and that we're all actually kind of on the same page. And I had to agree with you when you said that it's so important to cater for the extremities um, because and to have that design so that users, regardless of their ability, can flow on and actually have that experience to be a progressive learning experience mm -hmm. rather than going, what the hell is this? Because it totally shits us. It really, really does. So I think you're right on the mark there. And maybe a lot of the designers and developers would help if they started thinking, um, what's it like not knowing what I know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that would, I thought you were pretty on the mark there. And, and definitely that point about, you know, we should 
the human interaction. So like we saw with Square, uh, just te telling out your name, speaking out your name is a very natural human, human thing to do, uh, which is why they believe that's a better way to go than having to, again, wave a device. So human interactions is what we should be going for. Yes. Yep. Thank you.